Hi, Hi Internet. Internet. We're, We're Steve, Steve and, and welcome, welcome to, to Raffo. Raffo. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we've got a very special video for today. I am here with the one and only Steve Argyle. Hi, guys. Artist, illustrator, and general cool guy. This feller has done your favorite art for the Stormlight Archive, Mistborn, and Magic the Gathering, including Urbis Protector featuring Brandon Sanderson. Thanks to everyone who entered the giveaway. Steve is actually going to be drawing our winners at the end of this video, so be sure to stick around. Before that, bowl, though, not like, that actually is a very though. important uh, distinction. We'd have to do like description over the internet and oh. see how close I could get, Ooh, yeah. like, a, like a police sketch artist. So, Steve, tell us about yourself. Uh, well, there's, there's <laughs> That's a broad question. Uh, I'm an illustrator. I've been working for about 20-ish years on that sort of thing. Uh, before that, I was in 3D, 3D modeling, doing video games and stuff like that. So my artistic career goes back a little further. I started working with Brandon in 2016, okay. but I've known him since 2010. So it was, it was funny. We, we knew each other for a long time and then uh, Right around the time he started doing the Kickstarter books, we were playing Magic, and he was like, so how come you've never illustrated for me? And I'm like, because you haven't asked? I mean, I didn't want to be like, hey, we're friends. Hire me. You don't you know, want to be presumptuous and, yeah. like, yeah, insert yourself into that, sure. Yeah, and so Brandon was kind of like, oh. I kind of felt the same way. I'm like, hey, you should, you should draw for me if you didn't. And so we kind of had that, that mutual... I don't want to be the one to, to broach the topic. Uh -huh. um, and so that was just a quick like, well, it's dumb that we're both like that, so let's just do it. And that was where um, my first Brandon Sanderson piece came from. That was Vin, um, the, the red. I'm just going to, I'll oh. put a graphic up of it's, that. Yeah, it's, okay. it's this. Aha, we're making it hard Ooh. for you. <laughs> it changes sizes. It's Vin atop. Uh, Credit Shaw. I was also my first professional oil painting. Oh, really? Because um, I've worked digitally for so long. It's how, where I started. And I'd kind of been learning and I'd been tinkering. And when uh, Brandon hired me, I had a little bit more time than usual. So I was like, all right, this is going to be it. My first original oil painting, which Brandon has in his office now. To that point, you had only done digital then. Yeah, I kind of worked the wrong way through art. I mean, <laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted to do comic books. Starting with the Michael Keaton Batman movie, I was like, this is the world I want to be in. I want everyone to be wearing skin tight, ridiculous things. And I want everyone to have superpowers and all of that ridiculousness. And so I wrote my own little comic books and they were awful. Oh, they were so awful. I did all the crossovers. They would almost work now because I, I had a Wolverine versus Predator versus Terminator versus Aliens versus Batman. Wow. That was my first comic book. That's ambitious, uh, right? Yeah, that's quite the venture. <laughs> Yes, yes, and it was as bad as it sounds for a, what, 15, 14, 15 year old kid, but I did it. Then, of course, I discovered, well, puberty happened to me, and so I got interested in other things, trying to prove that I was a man, and somehow thinking that if I were manly enough seeming, I would get girls, and it never occurred to me to just be myself, but I... I, you know, I put on the act like teenagers do. For any teenagers watching, it gets better. Just, just tough it out. It sucks to be a teenager. It does get better. Anyways, so it fell by the wayside for a really long time. I would just doodle on notes and stuff, but I didn't really pursue art. Sure. And then I needed a job, as one does. I was working my way through school. I went to school for chemistry, and I thought, you know, I'm going to get a respectable job. This was before Breaking Bad, so it was all legit. I was <laughs> thinking I'm going to do, I actually wanted to go into pharmacology. I wanted to have a job, but not something that was going to take away from school, not a full-time job. So I started doing whatever was in the classified ads. And everything that was in the classified ads that was interesting to me, that was temporary quick jobs, were kind of art-related. We need a logo for our website. We need a mascot for our little newspaper ads. It was when newspapers still existed. I started doing those and I was like, there's a job, there, there's need for this. It's not like every company needs a dedicated illustrator. So that's what kind of started the idea in my head that this is something you can make a living at. I found an ad for a full-time position at a studio that was doing video game cinematics. And I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. I mean, holy crap, there's no way I would get that job, but I'm gonna check it out anyway. So I go and I bring a bunch of my 
my drawings, my bad comic books, because I'm thinking that's what they're interested in. And they say, well, um, we don't really need an artist so much as we need somebody who can use this software. It's really complicated and the hard part is just knowing how to use it. I had done a very short, unsuccessful internship at a company that did 3D stuff. And so I was like, oh, right, yeah, no, I've actually, I do have, I used to, I, I worked briefly for this company and they're like, oh yeah, they're almost the only game in town. I, okay, so you do have experience with this. And I'm like, yes. Totally you do. Know, I'm not lying. <laughs> It's not exactly what you think it is, but yes. So they said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring in for like our second round of interviews, we, we do a, a little test. So we'll just run you through the software, um, takes about an hour, and we just wanna see how well you know it. Because if you know the software, that's what we're looking for. So I'm like, awesome. They schedule it for that Saturday afternoon. On my way home, bought a computer. <laughs> and I searched high and low for the software. And that was an adventure in itself. It was very, very specialized, rare software. So I call the actual company that makes it, and I'm like, I cannot find the software anywhere. Can I order it directly? I need it fast. So this is weird. There was one place in Utah that had it, and it was a ski rental shop. Okay. I know, right? So I call them, and I'm like, uh, I'm sure I got bad information here. Do you sell software and they're like no we're a ski rental shop why what what there are no soft there's no software associated with skis there's like a rustling and some guy comes over and he's like uh what software were you looking for i'm like it's it's called um 3d studio max and they're like yeah we do we have it i'm like okay can i come get it oh yeah please do so i guess this guy was interested in it and he bought like 20 copies of it because it was the only way to get it anyways so i locked myself in a room and I went through their tutorial manual over and over and over and over again for about a week. My interview was on Monday, and then it was Saturday was the thing. And the tutorial was super basic, it was super simple. It was, here, make a ball. Now you know how to make a thing. Now, if you wanna animate it, here's how to make it bounce. Now here's how to make it bounce in a direction. And then here's how to put a light on it. Here's how to render it. Simplest thing ever. So I go in for my test interview, and I just know I'm gonna, I'm gonna bomb the crap out of it, because I, I do not understand how this stuff works. And they go, we just want to know that you kind of know your way through it, so we don't need anything terribly complicated. We just kind of give everybody the same thing and we kind of see how they work through it. So just animate like a ball bouncing across a room. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. And I- I can do that. I do that. And it takes me maybe 20 minutes and I go, okay, I'm done. And they go, oh yeah, you give up? Yeah, we, we figured. you're you're too young to actually know this, it's fine. And I'm like, no, I mean, I'm finished, I did the thing. And they're like, okay. And they come over and they look at it and they're like, all right, can you do it again? We wanna watch. So I do it again and it's faster this time. So they watch me do this and I got all the hotkeys and I, I, I'm not like looking through menus, I just da 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 da. And they're like, oh wow, you, okay. We, we thought you were just, Totally BSing, totally BSing your way into this. Yes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, well, you can start on Monday if you want. Like, oh this gosh. is amazing. So I started and they quickly learned that they were right the first time. I did not know what I was doing. The only thing you knew how to do was animate a ball bouncing across a room. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I was 19 and they were paying me minimum wage, which was probably like nine cents at the time. So I worked for them for almost five years. They told me later, much later, they're like, we wanted to fire you every day since day one. And we would go to lunch and we'd be like, we gotta get rid of Steve. I mean, he sucks. And they'd go, yeah, yeah, let's do it. I've gotta do this and this and this today, so you fire him. It's like, I don't wanna fire him. To, look, I got this and this and this to do today. You gotta fire him. Well, look, okay, he's costing us like a dollar, so we'll just do it tomorrow. So it was like that Princess Bride thing. Good night, good work, we're gonna fire we're you in the morning. Most likely fire you in the morning. And they just didn't, right? And in the meantime, I really was working hard to learn this stuff. I would go home and I would just keep practicing and keep learning stuff. So they told me after about three months, they stopped having that conversation every day. And they're like, he's fine. He's worth the minimum wage at this point. So we'll just let him, we'll just let him stay. And then that turned into uh -huh. about five years. And I went from that to video games. Video games sound super fun. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, there are some great parts of them. But what I didn't understand until I worked in video games was the fun stuff is a tiny, tiny little piece. And then the making it happen is the rest. So we would decide what the game was gonna be about and we'd brainstorm and we'd come up with characters and we'd come up with 
the environments, we'd figure out what it was gonna be, and we'd start doing tests, and it's like, this is awesome, and this is fun, and this is great, and that's about two weeks. And then it's like, now we have to populate this whole world with rocks and trees and buildings, and that takes two years. It's different now, but at the time, it was so much just monotonous. Okay, build a thing, now you need to do 10 versions Grass. of it so that as it gets further away from the camera, we, we down res it so that it will work on a PlayStation 2. And what I realized, and I worked for them for about five years too, is games are amazing when you're coming up with them and when you're doing like the marketing art and your advertising. And so I thought, I just wanna do that part. I just wanna do the drawing characters and coming up with the stuff that people go, wow, that's cool, I wanna know more about it. So I quit with plenty of notice I, I quit and it was uh, like, they're like, well, how long can you stay on? Is this your two weeks? And I'm like, I'm just quitting at some point. I'm letting you know that I wanna do something different. So they're like, well, can you stay on until we get this part of our game done, whatever. So I, my, my two weeks notice was, was actually six months notice. I kept working for them for a long time after that. But then I jumped headfirst into freelance with just the safety net I had saved up, which was very important because it took a little over a year before I was even breaking even. So I was burning through savings for about a year. I knew at this point, a lot of the people that I worked with had tried freelance and went, it doesn't work. They were very happy for their full-time job. I was young and stupid and I'm like, well, that's not good. I, I am different. <laughs> the rules don't apply to me. I mean, it ended up being true. What happened was I, I, I just burned through savings until I finally started getting enough clients and things to break even. And even at that, it was years before I was doing okay and making money. So how did you first get involved in magic? Like what was your first contact with Wizards of the Coast? My first contact with Wizards of the Coast was actually for Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, okay. That was all over email. I had done some work for Legend of the Five Rings. That's where I kind of started in my freelance career. I'd done enough stuff that I had a tiny little portfolio and I sent it into Wizards of the Coast and they gave me some Dungeons and Dragons work, which was tons of fun, it was, it was great. For Magic the Gathering specifically, I was at Gen Con in 2007, I think. The art director for Magic the Gathering was there, Jeremy Jarvis. He is an awesome, amazing guy. I was like, okay, I wanna work for Magic the Gathering. He's here, this is my shot. There's a lot to be said about meeting people in person, getting to know them, and having a personal relationship, which is, it's it's kind of getting harder to do. Wizards of the Coast, for example, COVID. does not go to conventions anymore, right? They used to go to San Diego Comic-Con, Gen Con, um, and a handful of other things. So you could go and you could meet them. Now it's, it's a lot harder. I found out that the way that it worked at Gen Con was the artists and the art directors all went to a, a hotel bar after the show and got drunk together. Well, that sounds easy enough, right? So I tagged along, like, okay, well, there's, there's Jeremy Jarvis. I don't wanna be like the, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt all the fun you're having, give me a job. You know, I just sort of, hey, you know, I'm uh, introduce myself and what are you guys drinking? I'll bring you some. And I grew up in Utah, right? I don't know anything about drinking. I don't know anything about alcohol or at least didn't at the time. And so he's like, yeah, let's do shots of crown. I don't even know what that means. So I just go to the bartender, I'm like, shots of crown, all these people, here's money. We talked about all kinds of things. It was a great fun night, but we never talked about magic. We talked a little bit about art, but not like in the context of I'm an artist. Uh -huh. It was just like, is digital art real? That was a topic at the time. Uh, but we never, we never broached like, I'm an artist, I wanna work for you. So at that point you were just like random guy yeah. That happened to be at the bar that they were at. Yeah. Uh, at that point, I was just some guy who was, he probably figured I was hitting on him, right? <laughs> Can I buy you a drink? Let's talk about stuff. Next day, I'm like, shh. Okay. I totally screwed that up, but I don't regret it. It was fun, <laughs> but I need to, if they do, they do this every night. So I got another chance. Night number two, complete repeat, right? <laughs> we, we just talk about like, oh yeah, when I was a kid, I did this and this and this, I should be dead. That's the other thing about being a teenager, kids. You guys get away with stuff you really shouldn't. It's incredible that any of us live to adulthood. So, repeat, didn't talk about magic, didn't talk about art. Night number three, don't talk about magic, don't talk about art. <laughs> and I'm just like the whole time, how do I breach the subject without being weird? And I never do, we don't talk about art or magic. After the show, I'm just like, God, I'm bad at this, right? I had one thing, there was one thing I wanted to do at Gen Con. So I email him and I'm like, 
You don't remember me. Oh, I mean, you might. I'm the creepy guy who kept buying you drinks for no apparent reason. But I'm an artist. I want to work with you guys. Uh, here's a link to my portfolio, all that stuff. So he writes me back and he's like, yeah, no, I saw your stuff in the art show. And I was like, I need to talk to this guy about working on magic. And it just like never, we were always talking about something else. And I was like, well, we should, I should get to this. And he, I, I just, we never did. We had kind of a mutual, we both wanted to work together and didn't ever get to the topic. So he gave me my first magic card, which was Ponder. It was the textless player rewards Ponder. And he gave it to me like two or three days after that email. He just, it was right away. And that one was fun. It established our relationship early because Jeremy is super funny and irreverent and just says stuff like it is. He's much higher up at Wizards now, but as an art director, he's like, so this is pretty simple. It's generic. You don't need to be familiar with all of the different things yet, but I wanted to get you something early. So this is just a wizard. He's staring at the sky. He's moving stars with his power. That's how awesome he is. What I don't want is the same thing, like that bearded wizard with a pointy hat staring at his navel with his hands. Like that is not magic. Don't do that. So the first thing I sent him was a sketch of exactly that. <laughs> just this big fat wizard and he's like pulling his, his navel open and he's like, my God, it's full of stars. <laughs> Whoa. Jeremy wrote back, he's like, all right, either you really don't get it or we're gonna get along really well. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent him my actual sketches right after that and that, that was the beginning of an ongoing relationship that continues to this day. Pro tip, they do have a sense of humor. Although I will say, other pro tip, they have to present a certain appearance to the world, so maybe don't always share some of that <laughs> with the world. I've gotten in trouble for that before. Speaking of doing cards for Magic the Gathering, is there a card that you want to do but haven't yet? Like, is there, is there a dream card that you would love to illustrate? How long do you have? The <laughs> list is long. That's the problem, right? Magic is so full of amazing stuff. Practically every set that comes out, I'm like, Oh, I want to do all of these. Oh, new planeswalkers? I definitely want to do new planeswalkers. Oh, look at how cool they're doing the dragons for this set. Oh, the angels in this one are totally different. Stained glass wings? Yes, sign me <laughs> up. The problem with magic is there's too much. I mean, the players kind of echo that too. It's like, how can we even keep up? There's so much new stuff and cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the strength of the game mm -hmm. because it never gets old. I mean, you have to work to overplay Magic if you're keeping up. Yeah, even with all of the huge amounts of releases that we're getting every year, like, there's a lot of cards to go through. That's true. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to do some stuff with, like, Kiora, for example. Okay. Because I like fish, and I like the ocean, and I like those weird kind of alien worlds that exist underwater or in the microscopic realm. Like, I'm, I'm weird that I like bugs. They're just interesting, right? Various planeswalkers, I love dragons, love angels, love demons. I haven't ever done demons or, devil, or devils. Like, I almost spoiled something there. I haven't done anything, <laughs> but I was like, and I haven't done, but never mind. Um, <laughs> In relation to that, uh, do you play commander? Do you have a favorite commander? I do. Uh, most of the group that I play with plays commander. My favorite commander, probably Carador, Ghost Chieftain. I get too attached to the things that I've, you know, my little, my little minion children. And so when they die, I feel bad. But with Carador, Bring them back. Yeah, they never really die. It's like, oh, you killed them. Well, welcome back. Every play group kind of has their tuning because Commander can go one turn win so weird and, and easy. So we've tuned our, our decks to be mostly fun and about an hour-ish long per game. So it works really well. The one thing about Commander is it's hard to jump groups because everybody, every group kind of does that where you have your, like, your super competitive stuff or you have your really janky stuff that's super goofy. And since everybody's doing the super goofy, it still it works. works out. So all of us have a handful of decks and we kind of have them labeled that way. It's like, here's our, this is just a solid game. Here's our, let's see if we can pull off this weird craziness. Um, my wife has a halfway built, well, I, built but is still tuning, un-commander. She's got a Togatog, -tog, and it's just all the weird cards. It's like the Christmas cards, it's the unset cards. It's everything she can find that's just weird and wrong. I built a, a squirrel commander with a bunch of uncards in it as well. So it's, those are dear to my heart. Do you prefer white, black, green? Do you have a specific color combination you'd like to do? Um, not really. I tend to gravitate a little bit more toward the longer tempo kind of stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of white and black. Dash of control is good, so a little bit of blue, but um, mostly, so the other format I play a lot is draft. And with draft, 
it comes down to you know you open a pack and you're what like, you well, got? what what am I gonna what am I gonna do? What am I gonna build around? So I don't have a hard preference, but for Commander, it does seem like I do a lot of black and white um, with a third color splashed in there. It's often blue. So let's let's say I'm I'm Demir. Or no wait, not Demir. That other one, Obscura from oh. New Cabaret. I'm Obscura. Let's jump into actually talking about Brandon. You say you've worked with Brandon since like 2016. You've known mm -hmm. him for longer than that. How did mm -hmm. you first meet? We first met. I was going to San Diego Comic Con. Uh -huh. and that's where a lot of these sort of chance meetings uh, or scheduled meetings happen. So uh, we were on our way, and my wife, Kat, was like, um, I forgot, I've read everything on my Kindle, so let's stop by the bookstore, I need an actual book. So she's looking through stuff and kind of in the Brandon Sanderson section, and she's like, I've been meaning to read Warbreaker, I've read all of these, I've read all of these, thinking of getting started in a new new series from Brandon. And, and have you all. read anything at that point? At that point, I had not read any of Brandon's stuff. Intrigue. Don't tell Brandon that. Chances are he won't <laughs> see this video, so it's fine. Actually, that's not true. I, I had started Elantris, okay. right? I had started my journey into the Cosmere, but I was brand new to it and I, hadn't, I had not finished anything. And I'd heard about Brandon and everybody had told me, they'd spoilered a lot of things for me. They don't like, this story's great. This is what happens and this is what happens and then everybody dies. I don't think that actually happened. Anyway, so. Well, <laughs> I mean, in Elantris, a lot of people do technically die. That's, that's true, they just, given the long enough scale. They don't last as dead. Nice fella comes up and he's like, well, um, I can recommend stuff, especially from, from this area. She's like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So he picks up Warbreaker. And he's like, so if you haven't read this one, um, but you have read these, I, I definitely recommend this one. Um, now, full disclosure, I'm a little bit biased because I wrote it. So, and we both, wait, what? <laughs> Brandon? Brandon said, oh my gosh. You know, he was there doing his little mystery signing thing that he does. Because he was on his way to San Diego Comic Con, same as us. We fangirl out. I had only read that bit of Elantris, but I was already a fan. So I was, oh, I fanboyed out a little bit. And Kat was like, oh, well, you, you guys need to know each other, right? She's, she's my art pimp. As well. <laughs> so <laughs> she's like, yeah, so this is my husband, Steve, and he does Magic the Gathering cards. And Brandon's ears perk up a little bit. Oh, Magic the Gathering. What, what's, what's your name? Steve Arkell. He's like, Yes, oh. you did Liliana of the Veil, and you did Chandra Blaze, and you did, like, yeah, I, I know your stuff. And so he was uh, super nice. And then we had to get on plane. When we got back, he, uh, he invited me to play Magic. At the time, he would do, like, local game stores, mm -hmm. where they would do a draft, and he would show up and play. And he's like, why don't we do a double-up celebrity thing where we'll do two-headed giant. It'd be me and you versus everybody. That sounds amazing. Brandon basically taught me how to play draft because I, I, you know, I knew magic, but I was like, I don't know how to just put a deck together like this. And then after that, he was like, we kind of do this at my house sometimes. If you want to, want to come play, we have a drafting group. So started just going over and playing draft, and that's why we knew each other for a long time before we actually started working together. Is it started as we're magic buddies. That's how we met, and that's how we got to know each other. Oh, and then even before, sorry, segue. I was getting a new card for forget the set. It would have we'll been say where it is right here. Steve's bad memory fixed with the power of editing. But I called Brandon up. I'm like, do you want to be on a magic card? Uh -huh. Do you want to be in magic? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do that. He, he came over here and we did a photo shoot. I'm not a good photographer. It's usually a cell phone and props around the house. So I've got pictures of Brandon wearing a towel as a cape with a paperweight <laughs> for a little magic thing. That card is Urbis Protector. He's a guy that when he comes into play, he brings an angel with him. So he's really good for the kind of bounce and boon type decks. That was a lot of fun. I gave him a print of it, which he has in his house. Do you have those <coughs> pictures of <laughs> with the towel cape? I do. Are those on the NDA? Am I going to share yeah. them? <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> I can ask him if he's okay with sharing them, but... We'll see. They're not bad or anything, they're just sort of goofy. As honestly most art reference photos are. <laughs> so many of my art references are me standing in a mirror in the bathroom just with a cell phone. Most of my magic cards, it's either me or my wife Kat that uh, I do reference for. And little tidbits is if you see hands with enough fidelity, they always have scars on them because I have scars all over my hands. Hmm. Um, and if anybody, for the most part, most of the illustrations I've done where somebody's getting killed, that's always me. <laughs> so it's just sort of an inside joke of anytime somebody is dying 
Um, sometimes it's cat killing me. Like oh. for Sure Strike, for example, that one you can't tell it's me because it's getting vaporized, but you can tell it's cat who's killing me. Um, sure Strike. So that joke, a little bit of a, a tidbit that folks don't know, that joke extends beyond me. So a friend of mine, also magic artist, Howard Lyon, mm -hmm. he got a card. The card is Heartfelt Reunion. It's Gideon in the afterlife, right? He's, he's died, sacrificed himself heroically, and now he's back with his regulars, his, his old buddies. And uh, Howard was like, you wanna pose for that? It's a dead guy, it's a dead planeswalker. That seems to be right up your alley. And so I went over and I posed for Gideon. So even in other people's cards, I'm the dead guy. Wow. Congratulations. You, you, make a, you make a delightful corpse. Yeah, thank you. Suits my complexion. <laughs> the pallid skin of the artist. I only turn pinker. That's, I've tried tanning. It just doesn't work. <laughs> I was told by a, uh, one of my patrons on Patreon, hi Doug. Hey Doug. Yeah. How are you doing? Um, that you, you had an interesting story about the art of ever flowing chalice. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what happened with that? So uh, a lot of times cards are play tested before they're ever given to the artist. And this was not an exception for Everflowing Chalice, however, it did change. The mechanics of the card changed after the art was done. Hmm. That's quite uncommon. Usually by the time it gets to us, everything's all settled and, and everything. So Everflowing Chalice, when they gave me the description, it was, this can produce any color mana. And so I tried to represent that in the artwork. I had flames coming out of the top. I had a wreath of water that was kind of floating around it. Um, I had skulls along the bottom. I had kind of some white light energy around it. Vines I got green somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I turned that in and it, uh, they're like, yeah, this is great. And then they came back a little bit later and they're like, so we need to change that so that it's non-color mana. So we need to take out all the references to the various colors. So basically change the entire piece. A little bit, because they were like, during playtesting, even with non-color mana, it's pretty powerful. With any color mana, it was absolutely broken. We can't do that. So I have two versions, you know, we'll do this. This is the card you've seen, and then whatever. Mm. This is the original version that has all of the little color references. Interesting. Not a typical process for magic. Usually there's very little revision. Usually they know what they want, they describe it well. We do sketches so that we know we're all on the same page. If there's tinkering, it's usually in the sketch phase. So they're like, move this around or let's put this in, this isn't working, whatever. But it's in that stage where it's really easy to iterate on ideas. Usually by the time you've turned in a final painting, you're good. There might be a tweak here and there, but it's not very common. And that's because the art directors at Wizards of the Coast kind of know what they're doing. They know how to ask for what they really want. Because there's a whole terminology sure. and language that comes with art. And that's what usually makes the communication difficult with new people. They don't necessarily know how to ask for what they want. Well, speaking of asking for specifics and the process of iteration, you did all of the art for the Knights Radiant Orders for the Way of Kings Leatherbound Kickstarter, mm -hmm. which they're all gorgeous. There's a lot of them. I mean, there's, I mean, there's 10. There's 10. I remember hearing, I, I think it was in a live stream with Brandon, where he mentioned the armor styles of all of the different Knights Radiant Orders mm -hmm. were specifically designed for each order. What was that process like? Like, what are some of the differences between the shard plate of the different Radiant Orders and why are those differences there? I wanted it to be clear if you saw shard plate, you knew it was shard plate. Yeah. Like, if you just saw a random piece of art out in the wild in the internet or at a convention or something, you'd just be like, oh, that's shard plate. Right, so the, the first bit was creating a visual language that said, this is what shard plate looks like. So there's like an overall list of these are the things that shard plate always has. Just general characteristics. Yeah, and that's things like the slits in the visors and having an interesting design to those, not just the usual European thing that you've seen. Shoulder pads that are symbolic of rank okay. and of the order, but not crazy like World of Warcraft gigantic, but they're they're somewhat ornamental because the rest of them, as Brandon describes them, they are, they're the tanks compared to regular armor being infantry. So they need to be big and powerful and bulky and looks like if you were in them, you couldn't move because it's true. If they're not, if, if they're not- um, Infused. Yeah, I didn't want to give anything away, but like if, they're, if they don't, if they're not infused, they are too heavy to move in. They are too big and bulky. So that's part of that visual language. They need to look that way. 
And so I needed some things that were common and would show, could be um, descriptive, ornamental. Um, they always have the big chest plate, which, mm -hmm. I mean, that's everybody, at least for me, like it's one of the first bits of description you get is um, Gavilar having his, his chest plate taken off and you picture it as just the one big massive thing. They basically have these, these three descriptive pieces, big chest plate, sort of ornamental, pauldrons, whatever you want to call them, and the, the visor. So then within that, every order needs to have something that gives it its own unique flavor mm -hmm. so that if things are done right, you don't just go, oh, it's shard plate. You're like, well, that's else color shard plate. So for every order, what I did was give them a little bit of their own language, like edge dancers, they're slick and lithe and all that. And so they have a lot more, um, they have gentle curves to everything. They're the lightest of the tank-like infantry. I mean, they're still bulky, but I wanted them to be more agile looking in comparison to say the stone wards where those guys are the tanks of the tanks. Uh, the stone wards, their visual language is everything is angled and square. The angles are always oblique. There's nothing sharp. Everything's just reinforced, tough, square looking. So for every order, I have something like that where those components all have an identity. With Dustbringers, for example, they're the opposite. Everything they have is sharp, acute angels, yeah. angles, and that gives you a feeling of aggressive. It's reminiscent of blades. And so them being the destructive, take everything apart. I want to visually convey some of that. Yeah. So that even if you don't know what a stone ward is compared to a dust bringer, if you put them together, you're like, well, that feels aggressive, that feels protective, mm -hmm. that sort of a thing. So that is one of the things that I tried to get across and put together for um, each of the orders of Knights Radiant. That's awesome. Specifically for the the Light Weavers mm -hmm. piece, you have, I assume, Shallan, and then a Thalen man. Uh, is is that a specific individual, or is that just a Thalen guy who you threw in there? Um, that's if a, you can tell us. Well, that's, so that's an answer that doesn't that doesn't entirely have an answer. Because here's okay. for the Orders of Knights Radiant pieces. Um, I asked Brandon, do you want me to do all the known characters? Do you want them to be generic, or do you want Kaladin to be the, the Windrunner? Brandon said, well, let, let's put the ones people know. So I'm like, okay, well, that still leaves a lot missing, right? We don't have examples of some of the Knights Radiant Orders. We don't even have, we haven't seen them yet. Brandon was like, well, here's what we'll do. You can do your thing. You can invent characters where there are not. Some of them may fit descriptions of characters who exist, but that's incidental if it is. Brandon did kind of give the little caveat asterisk. He's like, don't hold your breath, don't expect it, but some of them might end up in the books. So the short answer is, if you don't recognize the character, they probably are just a random, like the Thalen, he's just a Thalen. Okay. I was like, I haven't done a Thalen. I kinda wanna see oh. if I can make a dude with crazy eyebrows not look silly. Like a lot of people have asked about the- um, The other Bondsmith? Yes, the other Bondsmith. It's not anybody that existed like I say, I don't expect any of these to make their way into the stories, but that does happen sometimes. Um, and I've, I've asked Brandon, like, does the art ever influence the writing later? And he said, oh yeah, absolutely. Like, he, he looks through the fan art, he does get some good ideas and inspiration. I should put a disclaimer on that, because if you have a great idea and you send it to Brandon or, or some other, you, you send it to whoever you're, you like, they might think that's the greatest idea ever, but it actually makes them harder to, makes it harder to use that idea because there is now a potential copyright problem. Right. If you're like, well, that was my idea and I sent it to him. And so that's why a lot of times you don't get responses. Mm -hmm. And when you get big fandom saying, why didn't you do it this way? Like we have come up with, it's like, because, because you came, you came up, up with, with it, yeah. we can't use it because it's yours, not ours. And that happens a lot more in things like Star Wars. Yeah. We already had a great story for this character. Why did you do something different? It's like, because we had to. You know, we don't own that part of the story or, or whatnot. So Brandon does get it some inspiration from fan theories and from the fan art. But yeah, kind of have to be careful about that. Well, speaking of art influencing the story, you feature prominently in the Rhythm of War. <laughs> you yourself personally as Stargile the Lightweaver. I have wondered this ever since I first picked up that book and saw, wait, I recognize that name kinda. <laughs> Do you know Stargile the Lightweaver's real name? Aside from Steve Argyle, no. Does Stargile have an in-universe name? 
That's a good question. I don't actually know that one. Oh. Um, Oh, uh, peace. All right, carry on. Let's see. Uh, All right. We were talking about Stargile. I'm hoping he makes more appearances. I don't know how to bribe Brandon into that. And I, <laughs> I also don't want to mess with his process and be like, you know who you need a lot of? Stargile. One of my nefarious plans is um, I do a little bit of fan art on top of the art that I do for him when I'm not uh, too busy. And figure if I get enough of that, <laughs> and be like, this is in world, right? This is this is Stargile who who is doing all of these. So you should, that should, be a thing, in in the books. He becomes the official like portrait painter of the Knights Radiant. Exactly. I I always thought it would be fun to have uh, like an in world sketchbook. We've got Shalons, right? Uh -huh. And that's awesome. But I have a little bit of a special place for Stargile now. So I think it would be awesome to have like a Stargile sketchbook, or something. Maybe goes along with one of the Kickstarters later on. Yeah. You know, it's one of the rewards. I mean, there are Kickstarters coming up, so. That's all the questions I have. Thank you again to Steve for actually consenting <laughs> me coming into his house and interviewing him. Uh, well, thank you. It's a lot of fun. It, it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you also to James Banus of House of Banus Media. Thank you for him. He, he came and helped us film today, which was very nice. Also, also thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. Specifically, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Who get to see all of my videos up to a week early. Part three of Cosmere Connections is coming soon. Read and find out. Raffo. We did it. We did it, guys. We did it. Awesome. Cool. Thank thanks. you. You're free. That is a wrap on the Steves.